All right, we'll start. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, I am Manav, for those who do not know me, and I will be hosting the talk today. Uh, today's talk is a sequel to the um, talk we have had last week by Dara himself uh, on learning outcomes. Uh, this talk is part of the Water Classrooms project uh, that the Living Waters Museum is um, doing uh, in collaboration with DESF. Uh, they're transforming education for sustainable futures. So it's a research network uh, under the UK GCRF uh, fund and is uh, anchored by the University of Bristol. Uh, it has hubs in uh, many countries like India, Rwanda, South Africa, Somalia, and uh, Somaliland. Uh, in collaboration with TESF uh, at the Indian Institute of Human Settlements uh, and Living Waters Museum that is embedded in uh, the Center of Water Research at Isa Pune and also other partners like the uh, Science Activity Center at Isa Pune and also uh, Center for Environment Education uh, at Pune. Uh, these water classrooms are being developed for middle school students and these serve as uh, pedagogical tools uh, to inspire the young minds to engage with the different perspectives on water, let it be physical, geographical, uh, cultural, or social. Um, but uh, that is just naming a few. Uh, and these visually rich uh, tools uh, are supposed to enable them to solve real life problems uh, with a certain level of creativity. And the team itself is very diverse. It has content creators, it has educators, it has water professionals, it has students, filmmakers, artists, and, and everyone is learning from each other, and which adds to the richness of the project. And as a part of the, this project, and to enable uh, exchange of ideas and knowledge related to education, uh, especially uh, in the context of sustainable development, uh, we are planning out this series of discussions and we have had the first talk by Darab on learning outcomes, which was very enlightening for every participant uh, and they had a great deal of fun. Um, and today we will be focusing on rubrics, which are a tool for assessment, which Darab will talk more on. Uh, for those who were not here in the last meeting, I will introduce Darab just once again and then Darab can take over for the talk. Uh, Darab obtained a BSc in Environmental Studies from Northland College in uh, Wisconsin, US, and he worked for uh, 17 years with NGOs working on resolving issues of environmental degradation and livelihoods with village communities of Saurashtra and later in Kumaon and Garhwal uh, in Uttarakhand. Uh, he then reinvented himself as an outdoor and environmental educator and later trained and licensed as a science teacher. He is passionate about the outdoors as a great teaching tool and the need to connect theory with relevant real life concerns and experiences. He also has a natural affinity in his own words with the lovable craziness of the world of middle school students. Uh, so that's Darab and I let Darab take over now. Uh, you'll have a great deal of fun. Now I can promise it. <laughs> So that I'm over to you. Thank you so much, Mano, for, for, for a really nice introduction. Um, and I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay, so this is, uh, this is part two of, um, of putting the horse behind the cart is what I, what I named my talk. Um, this is part two, which is uh, about rubrics for assessment. Um, and so I wanted to sh begin by showing you a few pictures um, from, uh, from my experiences uh, as, a, as a teacher. So you can see um, here, there's, there's a, quite a contrast between what you see on the left side and what you see on the right side, right? So on the left side, um, you're seeing a presentation, right? And uh, it's about uh, temperate deciduous forests. And on the right side, uh, who can tell me what you're seeing? Anyone, go ahead. 
digging to make a you know to make a road maybe yeah yeah that that's a good guess and uh, and very much digging but what what these kids are actually doing is believe it or not on the steep hillside they're actually trying to create some raised beds for planting vegetables um and they they're trying to learn they're actually learning about organic farming in the mountains and they're learning first hand how difficult it is to actually prepare the soil to to grow anything on it so they're actually getting first hand experience of actually doing the digging and you can see on the side there there's a um there's a frame with a wire mesh and they have to actually strain all the rocks and everything through that um before they can actually create their raised bed so they're farming um over here you see a poster and this is part of what was called the science fair all the eighth class students had to do this and basically the last uh, roughly 5 to 6 weeks of their science class um they were split into groups and uh, they had to uh, they had to research a topic and and basically carry out uh, an experiment and present it uh and they had to they had to present it in the form of a poster and basically set up their displays in an open area and they were judged by a panel um over here uh who can tell me what you're seeing uh maybe they are making some kind of observation yes absolutely right so this gentleman uh, peter smethachek is a he's a very well known um entomologist actually and he's a he's an expert on uh, on butterflies and moths so he's uh, talking to the kids about the role of insects in nature and how butterflies are important pollinators and so how it's really important for us to uh, to take care of them and learn about them because the food that we eat actually depends on them and on the right you can see a a close up of one of the kids who's uh, taking notes or uh, claims to be taking notes don't see much writing on the page though and then this slide i actually showed uh, at the beginning of uh, of my talk on learning outcomes and that was to uh, illustrate a story which i told about how i was all excited about a class that i took on dichotomous keys uh and so i thought uh you know the best way to teach uh teach uh, you know middle school students about dichotomous keys is to bring something from nature so i brought a whole lot of different ferns because it was in the monsoon and i thought that would make it really easy for them to um to learn but uh, you can see that there's definitely some confusion on on the face of this student over here I mean you can take it in many ways you can you can say that both the students are looking engaged in the activity or you can also say that they're looking a little confused and not sure what to do next um but the reason I wanted to show you those uh, photos is they're all showing different elements of education and when we do standard cost planning and we start with either a textbook or you know some something uh and then we write syllabus from that um then what happens is that we end up grading those things or marking whatever assignments we give the kids in one particular way and so uh if you can imagine in each of those different scenarios let me just uh, go back if you can imagine uh these kids getting a getting a mark on their um you know on on their whatever it is assignment that they had to fill out here uh, questions that they had to answer and getting something like a you know a 70 or a 75 or something and then you have uh, these kids getting uh, also getting back some kind of number you know a percentage or whatever 
and then these kids also getting and these were i think uh, two of them working together um, so there was a group involved um, also getting a number and then these kids also getting a number then you can see that they learn where their gaps are in their learning where do they need to improve what did they do really well what did they not do very well and, and they need to improve on right so maybe we need to think seriously about the way in which we mark and assess uh, students and go beyond just giving them a percentage or a, you know something out of 100 or, or something out of 10 um, and that's why I've, I've, uh, I want to show you this slide here, um, which is talking about backwards design. So in backwards design, rather than starting with your content, you're starting with your broad learning goal. Okay, so what is it that you actually want to achieve? Uh, and since we're talking in the context of, uh, of a lesson, so I'm going to focus on that part, but you can look at it at many different levels. So you can look at it in terms of one lesson. You can look at it in terms of um, a series of lessons, a whole unit or a chapter. Uh, you can look at it as an entire course um, and so on. Okay. And so the broad learning goal will become broader or narrower, depending on whether it's a lesson or whether it's a whole course. Now, from those learning goals, then you need to set specific learning objectives. And now here, I just want to make a little clarification. So in the last presentation I made, I kind of glossed over the whole uh, idea of learning objectives and I focused on the learning outcomes, okay? But I do want to clarify that there is a difference between the two and I'll come to that later. But what we want to do here is um, we want to look at the idea of starting with a broad learning goal and then a specific learning objective. And then what's missing in this diagram is a specific learning outcome, which is what my last presentation was about. And then based on what is it that you want your students to know or to be able to do or to be able to demonstrate, after your lesson or after your series of lessons or, or your, your chapter, um, then you design the assessments, okay? So how are you going to uh, measure the evidence? How are you going to measure how much they've actually learned, how much they know, how much they've, um, they've understood? And then based on, on how you want to assess them, then you, you can pick and choose from a whole range of learning activities, which one fits best. If this is what you want them to know or to be able to do, then what's the best activity for that, okay? And that is, um, is a more student-centered approach, right? Because you're looking more at the, at the student's needs and you might actually, uh, you know, in this case, you might actually look at the composition of your class and say, well, you know, this class is very rowdy and they uh, can't sit still. And uh, if I take them outside, it might cause a, a lot of problems. So what you might actually do is uh, start out with something indoors and then kind of give them a carrot and say, if you, if you are well behaved, then I'm going to take you outside and I'm going to continue this lesson outside. But if you if you don't behave well outside, then I'm gonna to have to bring you back inside and we'll have to just sit at our desks and continue. So things like that, right? So you have a, uh, it, it's more student-centered and you have learning activities which are geared towards the kind of students you have. Okay. Uh, so again, I just want to revisit this for those of you uh, who attended my last talk, this will be review. Um, so what you want to know is what are the desired results? That's the first thing, right? So um, what will the students be able to do? Then you want to find out some kind of evidence of learning, right? What, what's the evidence? What will you have to show their parents? What will you have 
um, to show your head of department that the kids have actually learned something from your lesson or your, or your chapter or your course. And also for the students also to know, right? How will they know when they have actually reached the goals that have been set for them? Um, and third, then based on um, how you want to find the evidence of learning, then you, you plan your learning experiences and your instruction. So what do you need to do to prepare them for the assessment? And also how, how will they reflect and, and try and think back and figure out like what is it that they've actually learned? So that the reflection part is also important. Okay. So now we come to the idea of a rubric and a rubric is a really flexible tool and it can be a really useful tool to get around this problem of giving some number or some percentage, you know, like when we, um, when kids take a test or a quiz or something, they just get a percentage on it and that's that. And oftentimes they have no clue where they need to improve, what they've done badly on and, you know, so because that number doesn't really tell them anything. A rubric on the other hand can actually tell them those things, okay? So what is a rubric? First of all, it's a, it's a matrix, okay? Um, it's a matrix. Typically, it has a set of criteria, okay? Um, and each one of those criteria has some kind of a descriptor or, or a marker of quality on a, on a sliding scale. And then you also have um, a scale, okay, a rating scale. And you can use point values for that if you're comfortable, more comfortable with that, or you can use a descriptive performance level, okay? Um, before you begin, um, very important to, to really think through what it is that you want to assess, okay? So, just you know, to take a theoretical scenario, if uh, for those kids who who were uh, who were trying to make that raised bed, what is it that you might want to assess them for? You know, there it obviously wouldn't be the same thing that you'd want to assess the kid making the presentation, right? Um, so you want to break your rubric down into those strands. Um, which are um, what you're assessing and the bands. And so those are the levels of competency is what you can call them um, or level of achievement or whatever. And uh, so a well-designed rubric is, is effective. Um, and if you, so it's important. It's important to think through what it is that you're assessing and look at a lot of examples and get ideas from that, okay? Um, but basically what it's, it's just a little warning that a badly designed rubrics um, don't really provide effective feedback because they don't really match um, what, your, what your assessment needs are. So here's an example. So um, first thing is your level descriptors. Um, they need to be phrased in a particular way, right? They need to be phrased in terms of what your student can do rather than what they can't do. So here's, a, here's an example, okay? So you can see uh, the, the left-hand side column that has the strands, what we call the strands. So what you're assessing the, the student on and across the top, you have the levels of achievement, right? So uh, here, the kid is being assessed or, or the children in that particular class are being assessed on three, um, three criteria, okay? So let's look at the first one, analysis. So level one, meaning that, um, you know, kids who are kind of uh, barely being able to, to show anything, um, so the student can make simple comments. So this is, this is obviously about history, right? Um, this is something to do with history. The student can make simple comments about a historical event. Level two, the student can explain a historical event in some detail. Level three, the student can interpret 
a historical event in light of evidence. The student can, at level four, the student can construct a sophisticated and well supported analysis of a historical event. Okay, so here um, you can clearly see if you look at the verbs that are being used, make simple comments is a, is a phrase, then explain, then interpret, then construct. So at each level, the, the um, level of thinking, the higher order thinking skills is, is increasing, right? So making simple comments is like the, is the very base and constructing of sophisticated and well-supported analysis is the is is the the top okay so basically this is what a rubric looks like and um obviously it's subjective right so the it's up to the teachers um the the teacher's discretion how the teacher interprets the the assignment right but at least you've got a set of criteria that are the same for every student you're assessing. So it's not based on a whim. Uh, it's, a, it's, based on, it's based on some rules, okay? Some, some protocols, some rules, whatever you want to call them that have been established ahead of time and ideally shared with the students ahead of time also. So they already know that I'm going to be assessed on these criteria. And so I need to look out for for this stuff, okay? Uh, okay, so just, uh, now this is an example. This doesn't mean that you have to follow this, um, but just, just as an example, particularly for any kind of, um, you know, written work, um, these three basic strands are, are usually assessed. So one is analysis. So it's basically, um, to be able to interpret some kind of something and form an argument. Um, and then the evidence, right? So you often, uh, like I find in my experience, middle school students often say that this is what I think, or, or this is what is happening, but they don't really support that with any kind of uh, evidence. You know, they forget to do that, although it's there. And if you ask them later on, they'll say, well, I read that or something, um, but they actually forget to cite it. And that's extremely important. It's, a, it's an important skill. And then of course the literacy part. So, you know, whenever we assess, whether it's an oral presentation, like you saw in a, a couple of those slides, uh, whether it's something written or whether it's something that the kids are physically doing, um, when you assess them, there is language involved. They, they need to communicate um, some kind of ideas, uh, except maybe if it's purely a physical activity. Um, so language is involved. So somewhere in your, in your rubric, you do have to include language. And whether you're a science teacher or a social studies teacher or a math teacher, there's some kind of language involved. Then we come to the level descriptors. Um, so again, just to reiterate, uh, we always want to say the student can do something um, as far as possible. Now I've broken this rule myself, I'm, I'm gonna show you. Um, you can see here, here are a couple of examples. Um, so in red is uh, not a good way um, to write it. So the student can use evidence as opposed to the student can refer to some appropriate historical evidence in a simple way. Uh, who can tell me what the difference is between the two? Why is the, uh, why is the top one to be avoided? And why is the green, the, the statement in green a better way of, uh, of wording it? The red one uh, is uh, somewhat an abstract level, which may not give some details, but the green one uh, actually gives an example of what kind of uh, evidence the students can use and in what way. Right, right. Very well said. So it's too vague, right? Um, student can use evidence. I mean, 
what do we what do we mean by that but like you rightly pointed out the the green statement is much more um, specific that up sorry i'll yes. just uh, quickly interrupt yes uh, i now also has a uh, wanted to know that she has a question yes please so go ahead and ask can i uh, can she ask now or later i think it's better to ask now because otherwise we we lose our train of thought okay and you know and then we move on to something else and then uh, you know we we lose that i think it's important to capture those questions as they come yeah uh, thank you and thank you shavi for uh, introducing me uh, uh, the question which i have is about the rubric actually yeah uh, if we can uh, go back to a couple of slides sure. and uh, it's upon that i can ask my uh, rubric uh, my question yeah this, uh, this one uh, correct yeah we often come to know uh, about uh, the levels of bloom's taxonomy and how those are incorporated in learning yeah. and teaching so i was wondering uh, is there any mapping between these levels that uh, you have explained yeah. with the bloom's taxonomy level yes thank absolutely you. absolutely um and and thank you for thank you for ans uh, asking that question and i think uh, although i didn't mention it um but but in here you know what i just read out to you the analysis um the levels of achievement level 1 2 3 and 4 um they very much uh, match bloom's taxonomy so uh, construct is like the highest level of uh, of uh, higher order thinking where um, you're actually uh, synthesizing something and uh, to make a simple comment is is somewhere near the bottom but it's it's definitely more than just recalling it could also be you know based on your understanding of something so it might be at the second level and not not quite at the bottom but yes absolutely and i think that's a very important point you raised is very helpful also depending on what level uh, you know that particular assignment uh, if it's only based on recall then your your level 1 2 3 4 is not going to go all the way up the bloom's taxonomy the the highest level is probably going to be how well you recalled um what you were supposed to okay um but depending on how you want to pitch that assignment like if you if the assignment involves some analysis if the assignment um involves some communication um then where do you want to pitch it how high a level of thinking do you want your students to achieve you will you will make those levels based on that does that does that uh, help yeah thanks a lot very nice sure. explain sure okay um so okay so uh, now here the the second one you can see you can see exactly why the statement in in red is a really bad one to have on a rubric right so there's a a positive way of uh, of framing things and a student does not want to see something like that on a rubric right spelling is terrible um so you know a nicer way of of saying that and and something that actually again is more specific and kind of tells the student where they need to improve how they need to improve the student can attempt to communicate clearly although frequent errors of spelling sometimes obscure meaning so you see there's a very very big difference there right so just saying spelling is terrible uh, doesn't tell you a whole lot but here you're clearly you're saying that the student is attempting to communicate clearly but there are frequent errors of spelling and those actually um they mess up the meaning they don't allow the meaning of what what they're trying to say um to come out okay so here's a here's a rubric that i made as an example um and i i wanted to relate this to one of those scenarios so if if i'm taking kids 
for a nature walk to identify plants and animals um, in our local environment, what do I want to assess them on, right? Now, again, I'm not saying, please, you know, follow what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm showing you these, uh, uh, these slides to give you ideas, okay? And uh, I've, I've looked at hundreds of rubrics before I, I sort of was able to figure out what do I really want to do? What do I want to assess them on? I'm far from being an expert. I, I've made some rubrics and therefore I feel like uh, I, I, can, uh, I can be here in front of you showing you this stuff, okay? So um, please don't take what I say as, as gospel in any, any sense of the word. So um, here's what I wanted to assess my students on, right? So first of all, I want to see like, uh, are they actually observing anything, right? Are they able to identify something that's pointed out to them? So if they see it again, are they able to say, oh, that's the thing that you just showed us back there, right? So if it's pointed out to them, are they able to identify it, right? Then at the next level, are they actually able to point out something to somebody else, right? And how many of those things? So how much is, is really going in there? How much are they observing and absorbing? Then um, what kind of organization do they have, right? Do, do they actually have the materials they need, right? So we're going for a walk. So if you're going to observe things, um, you're going to need... You, you know, you can't expect to remember everything in, and keep it in your head. You need to write it down somewhere. At least I know I do, otherwise I'll forget everything. So I need a notebook or a clipboard. I need something to write with, right? Um, I need something to, to, uh, to keep a record of what I saw. So, uh, you know, a phone camera. Um, I need to take care of my, uh, my health. So I need to stay hydrated. Um, so I need to take my water bottle, right? So that's important too, you know, for any kind of field work, you need to be prepared. You need to be organized. Um, third thing, basic uh, following instructions and, and ability to focus. Are you, are you just... Uh... Now here I broke that rule. And I broke that rule because I didn't have a... I'm, I'm, I, I don't uh, have any shame in admitting that I, I didn't, I couldn't figure out how to frame it in a positive way. Um, now I think maybe if I put some more work into it, I could figure it out. But here, instead of saying what they can do, I put what they can't do. Does not follow instructions, um, not focus. So I need to, I need to find a better way of saying that. And for the uh, writing also, right? So. You, when you're making observations, you need to write something. Are you actually taking any notes? Are you making any diagrams? Or are you just sort of uh, blankly kind of listening and then, and then forgetting everything right away, okay? So, and then you can see, you know, I, I kept it really simple. So in terms of levels, uh, let's just take the uh, ability to be focused, right? So I'm starting with does not follow instructions or not focused to almost always follows instructions because I can't expect every kid to, you know, um, to follow all, all the instructions, but hardly ever does their own thing, almost always focus. So that for me is exemplary, right? And I feel that using these, um, these levels of, uh, of achievement are much more, uh, I guess, a more positive way of putting it and also a way that students can relate to, you know, that when I, when I give them the final grade, so I say, okay, um, you were over here, you were at the beginning level for powers of observation, um, you were at the exemplary level for um, organization, they'll be able to relate to that. They'll say, oh, okay, so that's where I need to improve. Here I was doing well, so I'm, I'm, I'm fine there. You see what I'm saying? So it, it, it makes more sense. It's, a, it's more positive and it's more The students actually know where they, where they stand. Here's another example. So this was for a podcast uh, that uh, I had my my students make. So again, you can see it's fairly, fairly uh, 
similar actually a level of preparation uh, but here a little bit different so attention to detail and originality of content and you can see my beginning level was narrative copied word for word from the video narrative right and exemplary was narrative shows excellent evidence of paraphrasing so uh, you know and here i'm not talking about effort right now you could what we could also argue and say that this actually is all about effort narrative copied word for word means very little effort compared to narrative shows excellent evidence of paraphrasing but it's not right it's also about command of language if you don't have a good command of the language you're not going to be able to do the paraphrasing right and this tells me as a teacher when i look at how much paraphrasing has happened or how much uh, copying word for word has happened that tells me as a teacher okay i need to look at this issue in more detail you know it's it's probably a language issue and i need to i need to work with this student on it if i just gave them some percentage or some number i i i would forget about it i wouldn't even remember that there was a language issue okay so this is helping not only the student but also me so both both of us are being able to look at this and say okay here's where i didn't do so well i need to improve on this part i did well on this part i'm sort of okay on this part um and then for a podcast obviously creativity appeal to the listener like so uh, there again like uh, if you're presenting something to an audience how much uh, like creativity are you putting into it are you how much are you thinking about your audience um uh, now we come to uh, this is a standardized rubric um that the ib middle years program uses in science and uh, for middle school students they have two levels of rubrics this is meant for class 7 and class 7 and 8 students okay um now in science they have four different assessment criteria i'm just focusing on one and that's what's called knowing and understanding and that's one that we're all familiar with because that relates to content okay so if i'm grading content like uh, particularly if it's uh, let's say this this is the kind of rubric that i am used to using to grade a test let's say a chapter test okay so again there's a, there's a four levels you can see um and again look at the verbs okay so at the bottom the student is able to recall scientific knowledge and then state and then outline and then describe um look at the bottom one there apply information to make judgments apply information to make scientifically supported judgments interpret information and finally analyze information okay now what i've done is i've taken this standardized uh, rubric and i've just added in my little bit for for one of uh, one of my tests okay and you can see i've just put in this, this test was about water quality uh, measuring water quality so i've just put recall scientific knowledge about important indicators of water quality because that's what i was testing them on okay i i've I've, uh, i've got apply scientific knowledge and understanding to suggest solutions to problems related to um, indicators of water quality set in familiar situations if you look at level uh, 7 8 it's set in familiar and unfamiliar situations so i've just taken a standardized rubric added in a few words that make it specific to a my test so that's also something you can easily do you can look through a whole lot of rubrics find something that makes sense you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time and i would say don't go down that route use what other people have done and just tweak it a little bit to meet your needs um it it's far less time consuming oops okay uh along with the rubric are these clarifications okay so 
this is also telling the student what I mean when I say recall or state or outline or describe or apply or suggest solutions or solve problems or unfamiliar situation. What do I mean by that? So this is on the next page along with the rubric. And uh, this is on a separate page. It's the last page of the test, right? So there's a test paper with all the questions. And at the end, there's this rubric. And I usually share this rubric um, before I give them the test. And uh, so they know, okay, this, this, is, this is what um, it's gonna be. The test is gonna be really long. Um, and I just wanted to come back here, just uh, to this point. I think this is the right point to just come back to this. Um, in the last talk, uh, I didn't pay enough attention to the learning objectives. And I just focused on the learning outcomes. I think it is really important to have learning objectives. In the template um, for our lesson plans, there is very much a box for learning objectives. And that is where um, you're actually saying what you hope the lesson will achieve. What, what is the lesson going to actually cover? What content is it going to cover? What skills um, is it going to cover? And the learning outcome is on what the uh, what you want your students to be able to do, right? So it'll be framed in a in a very different way, right? So the learning outcome will be um, what students uh, what the student can do, and the learning objective will be more like uh, the lesson will uh, discuss this or the lesson will introduce students to this. Okay. Well, I have a doubt here, if I may. Yes, of course, Aparna. Please go ahead. Uh, it's about learning outcomes and learning objectives. Yes. So, um, actually, I have two doubts here. Uh, yes. First is, uh, would it be possible for you to explain more with some examples? And uh, second thing is um, regarding uh, the second uh, bullet. Uh, yeah. so would it be possible for you to move one slide back? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so here, when we say focus on uh, learning outcomes, which focus yeah. uh, on what the student should know, yeah. realistically be able to do it uh, by the end of the assignment. Yeah. So uh, can we include the tech home message in learning outcomes for a student? Uh, see, now that depends. That depends on uh, whether you can measure it or not. Um, so that is the really important part. Uh, I actually have not included those slides here. And uh, since there's only 10 minutes left, I'm gonna have to say, I don't want to go into detail on that, but my slide presentation is very much available to you. Uh, and the recording of, uh, of the last talk that I gave, which was focused on learning outcomes. So um, if you wouldn't mind Aparna having a look at those, and then if you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to, uh, to connect with me uh, any way you want, and I can give you further guidance. Would that be acceptable? Great, thanks a lot. Sure. Uh, okay, so, What I wanted, uh, wanted to do now was, I, I want, just wanted to make one more point about the rubrics, and that is that your rubrics ideally uh, should match your learning outcomes, right? Now, sometimes your rubrics may cover a little bit more because your learning outcomes may be uh, you know, more focused on content but your rubric might also be uh, assessing, for example, what I showed you, it might also be assessing um, creativity and, and things like that, okay? Now you can choose to, to include that in your learning outcomes for the lesson um, or that particular assignment perhaps, or you can choose to, to leave it out. 
and only include it in the rubric. But the important thing is that the students should know what they're being assessed on before they're actually assessed. So they can be mentally prepared for that. So if they, if they know that they're going to be assessed on creativity, then they'll be mentally prepared for that. And, and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll think ahead and, and plan ahead. If they don't know that and you spring that as a surprise, then it's kind of unfair on them, right? So, and I believe me, I've also been guilty of doing this, um, of forgetting to actually share the criteria ahead of time. And, and then, uh, uh, you know, for example, when it comes to a poster, you get some, you know, such elaborately designed and made because those kids are really good at art. And they've hardly focused on uh, the content that they need to show on the poster. And they've done some beautiful artwork um, because I haven't clarified what is it that I was assessing them on. And they've chosen to focus on the artwork because they're good at that. Okay, um, so we have a little bit of time left and I think it would be nice to just Let's let's just take a just take a few minutes to actually work in uh, in groups and try and just design a simple rubric just off the top of our heads. Um, so last time we we were um, we were trying to come up with some learning outcomes for um, wastewater. So let's just take a simple. Uh, activity. Uh, can anyone remember uh, any of the activities that we uh, or, or learning outcomes that we came up with for the very first uh, bullet point here? Where does my water go from the last talk? I think I remember one uh, where uh, we were talking about uh, trace, uh, well, first was identifying uh, what is wastewater. Yeah. And uh, second was uh, tracing the parts of wastewater. So that was something we were talking about. Okay. Okay. So identifying. Uh identifying what is in wastewater what are the what are the things yeah. that you that constitute wastewater hmm. okay and uh, and what might be uh, an activity um, that uh, that that the students would do to identify that did we talk about that as well uh, i don't remember talking about any activities okay um, yeah. All right, well, then maybe what we can do is we can just focus on that, all right? So you want students to identify um, what, what constitutes wastewater, right? And you want students to, you want students to identify uh, or, or or illustrate the path of, of wastewater, right? From, uh, from tap to, from tap to river or what were we thinking there in terms of a path? Sir, uh, purification of water. Oh, okay. Different stages. Uh, different with stages. diagram also. Okay. Use of alum like that. Okay, okay. So, uh, Let's let's just uh, to keep it uh, simple. Let's take the first one. Um, so identifying the components of wastewater. If we take that as a learning outcome, and now I want each group. I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, split you into breakout groups. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen. Um, so identifying the different components of wastewater. So it's up to you as a group to figure out what is it that you want students to do, what, what activity or what assignment you want to give them 
to, to identify the components of wastewater and just come up with a, with a simple rubric um, to, to assess them. So what are you going to assess? Okay, and it can be only one thing if, if, you, if you want. Okay, I've given you more columns. You don't have to use all of them. And uh, you can use, you can use uh, four levels. Um, and I would say, just for the sake of you know keeping it simple, use beginning, uh, developing, uh, etc. Uh, exemplary, okay. Um, and then just uh, write down your criteria and just put a very simple, like one sentence uh, for for each box to identify. Okay, so let's see how many people do we have. We have seven in total. Are we have breakout rooms. Seven. Okay. So should we let's let's should we work in uh, let's work in pairs then? What do you think? Would that work? I think two breakout rooms could be two breakout rooms good enough. Okay. Yeah. All right. Two breakout rooms it is. Uh, can you see it? Um, not yet. I think it will take a second. Okay. Wait, wait. Yeah. I think it's asking you to provide permission. Okay. Just a second. Uh, can you see it now? Yes, I can. Cool. So uh, we have to so the activity that we have is identifying different components of wastewater. Uh, so, so I think uh, we can go about the uh, say turbidity of it, like how it is uh, looking like, how cloudy is the water. Uh, sure, but then maybe more fundamentally would be uh we just discussing what are the components that we add so that the water becomes best water sorry i mean i mean at the origin i mean at the source of best water generation huh. what are the things that makes normal water best water right okay and i mean that was like more sort of uh asking kids to remember or or recollect their experiences with wastewater and like what all they see in in nalis and or how does water becomes wastewater at house right so we could like start from what happens at home um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. i mean what happens at home and then at a larger scale, maybe city sewage, etc. Then we can move towards like industry. So basically, the sources that they know and the things that they might be aware of. So then uh, that could be the point where we can distinguish between, uh, say, degradable or non-degradable or biological waste. This sort of things that are the components of wastewater. Right. So, what, and, so, so what are we analyzing for here? Like in this, uh, they want to, they should be what they should be identifying different components of wastewater, right? Right, right. Okay. So, and the components, like at the first place, before going to uh, their molecular and other structural EM, the first thing is what actually makes it wastewater, like what sort of things lead to water becoming not usable right so what do we throw into it 
Uh, beginning beginning would be being able to identify the different different components of waste water at home then developing developing would be developing would be uh, what happens at a industry city or industry hmm? but that's again uh, yeah i mean something then we can go for like classification of the rest right. the other uh, components okay yeah hmm? Okay. Even agriculture makes water waste water because okay, of the yeah. excessive usage of uh, larger scale industries. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Agriculture, city level, city slash town level. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now uh, for. advanced level it could be uh, what you said it could be classifying where these Plus, components like yeah. biodegradable water species what it is is right a complete being being able to classify classic for the various components by their nature hmm? and the last could be a uh, base to uh, like suggest ways to remove these components hmm right or, say or say reduce either of those either reduce or uh, remove reduce or reduce or and clear uh, or i mean uh, i'm saying recycle what do you do filter filter out the waste to filter out the either of I, either of those it could either be okay reduce or filter reduce or it, uh, it could be also re remove okay Employees are ready for. Mm 
their category okay uh rajuta and manav um, hi hi so i'm i'm going to um, i'm going to uh, close the break, breakout rooms now um so okay. you have basically one minute before we come okay. back together so if you could just figure out what your strand is going to be so what you'll put in that uh, left hand column um that kind of ties all this together you're beginning developing accomplished exemplary oh, and if that's... you can summarize that and put it in that uh, in that uh left hand column so that will be your actual your criteria okay so if you can if you can do that then um then we can we can just share some of our ideas okay okay uh, so the problem yeah. is that uh chavi has shared an image yes i know i know so yeah unfortunately yeah it was supposed to yeah. be a word file yeah uh, but somehow but don't worry about that it's okay because you i mean you've done some work on it and you can just share it as uh, whatever you've written is attachment? fine attachment it's fine okay. you can share screen actually okay yeah you can just share your screen as it is that's good enough okay okay, okay? Hi again. Hello. Do you, uh, Rujuta? Do you have uh, you have screen sharing rights, right? Uh, I guess so. I mean, I could share it last time, so I think okay. I should be able to. Okay, great. Because I'll ask you to share your screen first. Okay. Okay. The other group should also be. the 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 breakout rooms are getting close so they should be on in a few seconds yeah here they come okay welcome back everybody and uh, just a quick apology i'm sorry i I've, i've allowed this to go over again um way over my my 1 hour deadline and i do apologize for that um but i i just i really wanted you to get the experience of actually trying to get your head around trying to um actually create a rubric and just sharing a few ideas um so i'll try and uh, wrap it up really quickly here but i do really want you to just share some ideas of what you've come up with and and that's a way we can all learn from each other and that's why i wanted to do this so i'm going to ask rujuta to uh, to share her screen um uh, and uh, and just uh, show us what uh, she and manav have come up with okay i'll just share my screen thanks Uh, can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay. So we we wanted to discuss what could be the rubric for uh, identifying different components of wastewater, and the overall idea that I had, I mean, we had in our mind was one: it should be able to understand the different components. according to their sources and their types and also they should be able to know what could be the ways to either reduce or uh, reduce the uh, waste material in water at the origin or what could be the ways to filter out the uh, components of waste water so beginning level is uh, understanding how we 
create an uh, understanding the waste water at home like what what all uh, our activities make water waste water then understanding the same process at a larger scale say waste water in industries waste water at city level in agriculture etc then uh, the the next level the completion level was being able to classify these components according to their properties a biodegradable or not are they biological like this biological source or or chemical source etc and the size of particles etc and then the exemplary uh, uh, skill level skill would be being able to suggest ways through which we can either reduce the what uh, uh, waste water components at the origin or filter out it by some way okay and uh, so so uh, does anyone have any uh, questions or or comments for rajuta please go ahead so yeah i i would like to say something yeah i think uh, this is uh, quite quite nicely done um also when i come to the exemplary um okay. uh, there uh, so it it would be like uh, if i imagine this would be like uh, not a single uh, class but it would be uh, multiple classes to reach the exemplary stage for any student uh, mm -hmm. because you know I, i feel like the first three can probably be achieved in a single class but the fourth one might be harder unless it's like hmm. a did workshop so that's all uh, right, right. And, and let me just uh, uh let me just uh, add in a little point here um so just to add to chavi's point uh see rijuta you don't need to feel like you have to have four levels okay so okay. yeah i mean if you if you feel like you know three levels are good enough for you to mm -hmm. um, to assess the students then that's mm -hmm. fine it's your call you know it's uh, fair enough yeah Or so as maybe, an educator it's it's up right, to you right right maybe we could uh, uh split the third point into two where one is the what do you call basic level of classification and some sophisticated sort of classification that right. would be done right okay mm -hmm. um so yeah so so thanks a lot thanks a lot for putting in the effort and 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 putting this down and uh, i think uh, i think it you know th this is it's it's very clearly a rubric that's it's testing it's assessing the students on um, the level of understanding of the content so how how deeply they've understood it and kind of broken it down so going from from home to uh, a larger scale and also like breaking breaking it down into the different sources biological chemical um etc so basically going from simple to more complex and that's great that's exactly what uh, a rubric needs to uh, needs to show so thanks for thanks for putting in that effort thank you yeah and uh, could could the other group please share their rubric as well uh yeah i can share my screen um so i uh, i think uh, a couple of times we also had like we were also thinking that we could only make you know three uh levels well and yeah. probably and not four absolutely so fine absolutely uh, fine great point yeah so we actually uh, interestingly we we never finished you know what was the exact uh, you know identifying the components here as you can see that sort of left remained empty and we uh, sort of worked on the uh, the other two that that sort of got linked to these uh, so i will talk about those 
so first, I before identifying components, uh, we uh, started thinking about identifying wastewater itself. Um, in which, uh, in beginners, uh, we have uh, that students uh, use the parameters like color and odor of water to identify it as wastewater. Um, and developing is uh, that the student is able to, we couldn't really find a verb, maybe recall, but we were not entirely convinced as to what verb we should use here. But they're able to, uh, they, they are in some way, they, they know, they understand that they can also check parameters, which are not um, directly related to our own senses, but um, like chemical or uh, uh, in nature, like pH and dissolved oxygen and, and those. Um, and uh, accomplished one is where they're able to draw a conclusion whether the sample that they have is wastewater or not, based on the evidence that they get from the previous uh, two uh, options. And uh, exemplary is where they are able to draw, uh, sorry, not, uh, they, they are, they're able to do that, but they're also able to develop visualizations to communicate what they find through charts and plots, those kind of things. Uh, the other one that we uh, ended up doing was uh, cleaning the wastewater. Um, so here, uh, students are able to identify methods and materials required for cleaning wastewater, and they're able to determine which parameters they will use to determine water quality. Uh, developing is uh, students apply or experiment different kinds of methods to obtain a clean water sample. Accomplished uh, students can draw steps of cleaning. They're able to differentiate between clean water and wastewater. And uh, exemplaries that they can show comparative study on which method was more or less effective and why. And they can make recommendations. Yeah. Great. So uh, again, I, I think this is really good work, all of you. Um, you've really put in a lot of effort in trying to figure out like how you want to kind of uh, assess the different levels. Um, and I think it generally, it, it makes a lot of sense. Perhaps one thing here though, under exemplary, under identification of wastewater, what you've said is that uh, to qualify as exemplary, you want uh, uh, the student to also develop some kind of communication or visualization. Um, and I'm wondering whether that would be a separate criteria. So, you know, what level of communication? So you, maybe you want to just expect that of all the students that you are going to communicate what you find. And then the levels of communication would be like, you know, one sentence compared to uh, a paragraph compared to a paragraph with charts and some kind of visualization, how good that visualization is. That's okay. the only other suggestion I would, I would really have. Um, uh, just, just as a suggestion, you know? Um, yeah. And the other thing is that looking at the cleaning wastewater, um, so here you've got at the beginning level, you've got identify, and then uh, for developing, you've got actually applying uh, different kind of methods. And then for uh, accomplish, you've got can draw steps of cleaning. Uh, and I'm guessing that what you mean by that is that if they've actually applied and experimented, then they have a much better understanding of the steps of cleaning and they wouldn't have that just by identifying methods and materials. That's what, uh, that's why you put that under uh, accomplished, right? Right, right. Right. And then, and then uh, for example, they, they're going one step higher. They can actually, um, they, they can actually tell you about which was more effective and, and they can also ex explain why and they can, they can make recommendations. So that's great. So you've definitely, you've gone from the basic to the complex and not to worry about not finding the right verb. That's perfectly all right. 
okay. then there's, yeah, there's, uh, there's always, uh, there's always scope for you to chop and change things. Um, but it's just really important when you're doing anything like this to get something down on paper, and then you can, you can, uh, you can hone it and, and improve on it. So great work, everybody. Thank you for putting in the time and effort. Thanks, Karan. Well done. You know, okay. Shalya Parna want to make any comments? Yeah, please, please go ahead. And in the meantime, I'm quickly going to share my screen again. But yeah, so please go ahead. Any comments? Any uh, anything? Anyone it else? It was want? interesting, sir. It was interesting uh, so that glad. you have taught uh, four stages, and uh, we have tried to uh, find out which will be applicable in which stage. So it was yeah. great brainstorming also. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Chavi and Aparna. Thank you so much. And I just want to end uh, just by, by showing you this, this photograph. And, and this is in contrast to the one of the, the two students who were kind of looking at the ferns and looking quite confused. Here you can see two students who are Clearly, they seem to be acting out something very dramatically, and they, they seem to be pretty happy, and they seem to know what's going on. So, uh, hopefully, that's a that's a, a happier and, and positive note to end on when we uh, when we try and uh, put in the effort on on uh, on designing uh, rubrics which which actually help the students figure out. Um, where they need to improve. And that's that. Thank you so much, all of you. I'm so sorry to take a half an hour, 35 minutes extra. Thank you for bearing with me and, um, and staying on and, and, uh, and putting in all that effort. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot Thank you uh, Barab, uh, yeah, for both the sessions. Most I welcome. I, I let Manav uh, take Yes, thank really you. It's exciting to work in the group and then do this hands on activity to uh, plan the rubric. It's really a good exercise and exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darab, and thank you everyone who joined in. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone had a lot of fun, uh, as I have promised. Uh, Darab, uh, um, Dara, thank you for uh, holding two sessions, taking out the time to um, actually bring forth these two ideas. I have learned quite a lot uh, from these two sessions and uh, thank you so much. So glad. Um, so glad. I would, uh, so we will, for the audience, we will be sharing uh, yet another feedback form uh, for the session. Uh, it would be great if you fill it out so that we have uh, so that we can improve on how we organize these talks. Uh, and if you have any more topic suggestions, please feel free to uh, drop it in the chat suggestions here or even DM uh, the Living Waters Museum on the various social media handles. Uh, we will be sharing all the social media handles separately in a mail. And uh, it would also be useful if you would uh, follow them on the on social media so that you get updates on uh, the different uh, events that we are holding. Uh, thank you all. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, everyone. Really, really appreciated how receptive you all were and great work.